you? Good, good, good. Let me just do a little bit of preamble. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I, I'm not going to do as long a preamble because we had James on a show, well, technically two thirds of a show about a month ago, and we had some connectivity problems. So uh, uh, the end of the show got a little bit cut off. So rather than just make stuff up. I wanted to, to bring him on and kind of finish out that conversation. We were just getting into kind of the, the, the meat and bones of the, you know, the finance of the Mars Society. So um, I'll post a link here in a minute to the original episode. Uh, it was about five weeks, six weeks ago. And uh, I definitely want to encourage you to catch that because in that he gave his background and it's pretty fascinating how James got to where he is starting from the very first Mars Society conference uh, to now. It's been a pretty, pretty wild ride. So definitely worth catching the, um, the first part of this episode. Uh, and of course, we'll, we'll cut it into a single episode when it goes to the podcast. Um, but without going into a lot of preamble and history like we normally do. We're just going to jump straight into it. Um, by way of introductions, I'm the president of Liftport Group. We've been doing space research focused on the moon for about 20 years. Uh, during the pandemic, we pivoted to doing a lot of conferences as a service and uh, recently podcasts as a service, uh, as a way of just keeping the doors open, keeping the revenues going uh, during the pandemic. And in the last few weeks, we've had some pretty cool conversations about pivoting back into doing uh, lunar, lunar research, lunar infrastructure research. So we'll continue doing podcasts as a service and conferences as a service because it's important to us. Uh, but uh, we also want to get back into working on lunar infrastructure. So uh, keep your keep your fingers crossed for that. We hopefully will have some news in the probably the first week or so of February. I don't think it's going to happen in January. And with that, um, no more preamble. Let's uh, let's bring James Burke back in and talk about the Mars Society. Um, James, let's have you give just a brief overview to folks that are tuning in for the first time. Uh, and then we'll jump into kind of, you know, the, the reason for the Dare Greatly podcast is to talk about uh, the money, the finances, the commercialization of space. Uh, and so, you know, you have a role in that. Uh, we talked with um, Dr. Robert Zubrin last week and how he had a pretty outsized um, influence directly on Elon Musk, and that certainly has had some impacts throughout the whole space industry. So let's let's talk about you. Let's talk about the Mars Society. Give us a little bit of background. Um, hopefully, they will have gone to the other other program. Yeah, sure. So I'm with the Mars Society. We're the world's largest nonprofit organization that is focused on settling Mars and sending our human explorers to Mars. Um, I'm the executive director of the Mars Society. I'm also a founding member, and I have been a volunteer for the last 25 years, up until about a year ago uh, when I was hired on full-time to be our executive director. Okay. Well, since that's the way you brought in your intro, let's talk about that. How did that, how did that happen that you became the executive director um, there have been other executive directors, several that I can think of, um, but your role is different from all of theirs. So talk about the differences and then talk about how, how did that happen? Yeah, as I mentioned, I've been a volunteer uh, for 25 years, started out as the Seattle chapter lead uh, organizer and also helped out with a lot of the IT needs of the society uh, for the last 25 years. Um, about 10 years ago, I got hired on as a part-time webmaster, um, kind of as a, as a paid staffer, but also um, had the title of director of information technology. Uh, so that was about 2012. And then um, 
as you mentioned, we've had a series of executive directors like Susan Martin was the executive director back when I got brought on as um, webmaster and IT director. Um, and we've had others, um, but they've always been a volunteer, uh, unpaid and part time and really with a limited portfolio of, um, of, of things to do, you know, things to manage. Uh, so what happened about a year ago, a little bit more than that was um, our society. We got a big donation from Blue Origins Club for the Future, who gave a million dollars to 19 different space related nonprofits. And we were fortunate enough to be one of those 19. And so the board of the Mars Society and Robert Zubrin, our president and founder, decided that now is a good time to bring on a paid full time executive director. And so um, we had many people apply for that. We had over 40 uh, candidates and several finalists and the board chose me and I'm very thankful and grateful and I'm just trying to do a good job with it because it's, uh, it's ama an amazing opportunity for me and something that I really want to do. Um, it's my dream job, basically. I used to work at Microsoft as a technical project manager um, and did this as a fun thing on the side as a volunteer thing. And now I'm actually doing it as my full-time job. So it's very kind of an amazing story and an amazing path I've been on. And I'm really excited about it. Well, it has been really terrific. And I know you've worked at this for a long time. I've known you for about pretty close to two years now and working pretty closely together for call it the last 18 months or so. Um, and just to kind of see from the edges, the transition, your own growth, the growth of the organization, the shift. Uh, it's been it's been pretty amazing. So congratulations to you and and to the uh, to the society because um, I think it's a big important step. T talk a little bit about the club for the future. What's it about? What's it for? And why did they give you and eighteen other organizations you know wheelbarrows full of money? Well, the, the opportunity came up through their new shepherd space tourism flights. And there was a specific major donor, major customer of theirs that wanted them to give away the, the money. And so they decided, let's pick 19 nonprofits and give them each a million dollars. And the theme, the theme of the selections was STEM education mm -hmm. because Club for the Future, which is Blue Origins nonprofit arm, is focused on STEM education as its, you know, as its primary way to go after its mission of inspiring young people and inspiring people to be more, more you know, participative in the space community, um, which is great because that's also for the Mars Society. That's what we want to do as well. Of we want to inspire the generation that's going to settle Mars. Um, so yeah, so they basically, you know, and I, I heard a little bit of the insider. Um, story as well from uh, Michael Edmonds, who's the president of Club for the Future and spoke at our conference last uh, last October, just a, about seven weeks ago now. Um, uh, he basically said, you know, as they were deciding which nonprofits to give to, um, you know, when it got when they got to us, uh, you know, they, 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 they were saying that they were meeting with Jeff Bezos and making the decisions. And he said, well, do we really want to give it to the Mars Society? I mean, usually we're not focused on Mars. Usually we're focused on the moon and Earth uh, orbiting uh, space colonies, sort of the Freeman Dyson vision, or sorry, the um, Gerard K. O'Neill uh, yeah. vision of the future. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so no, Jeff said, nope, give, give, them, give them the Mars Society one of these. Um, you know, they're part of the space community and we don't want to discriminate, you know? Right. Um, so, so yeah. And so we're really thankful for that. And we just had our, our meeting of the 19 organizations. We meet, I think, I guess twice a year at this point, right. uh, maybe it'll be more often next year because it was a really good meeting we had last, last week. Um, each of the 19 organizations presented on what they had done for the last year related to the, the grant uh, from Blue Origin Club for the Future. And so when it was our turn, we actually got to go third in the out of the 19, which was cool because the last, the first meeting we were at, we were one of the last ones. So it was cool to get to go third. 
Right. And Robert uh, talked about our high school engineering course and competition that we recently held last summer that was very successful. Uh, we had 40 students from around the world met over Zoom, and we gave them two weeks of lectures from a bunch of experts, um, you know, folks that speak at our conference about Mars exploration. And then the students formed teams, and they actually designed a Mars mission together. And there were five teams, and they competed. They each presented, and then they criticized the, each other's uh, presentations and designs, and then they had a chance to rebut the criticisms. Right. And they all turned in amazing work. Like, these are high school age yeah. students, and they turned in college-level work. Yeah. And we ha our judges were really impressed, and we were really impressed. We're actually going to publish um, a book of a lot of their designs. And a lot of them came to our conference, Arizona State. Yeah. I met and several. spoke, we had a panel about it. And so it's just been a very positive um, program. And so we talked about it with Club for the Future on that call, um, among the other amazing work that the other organizations were doing as well. I remember a lot of examples of, you know, other organizations were doing really innovative things as well. For example, Planetary Society has a new program for younger kids called Planetary Academy. Okay. And, they, and and we've spoken with them about it to see how we could help out promoting it. Cool. Um, but but essentially, it'd be a, a kit to kind of get a young person involved in space and interested in, in it early on. And then they kind of stay with that student as they get older, um, which is a great, you know, approach. And it fits in well with what I think we want to do yeah. long term. Uh, with the Mars Society in our, pro, in our in our engineering program. So anyway, yeah, there's a lot going on with the education in the space community right now, in the nonprofit space community, and I think that's great. Well, with 19 organizations, in fairness, $19 million going to space advocacy nonprofits, there were there that was it was they were all nonprofits, right? The, you couldn't be a for-profit company to do that. Yeah. So that's it's correct. It's it's 19, folks like the Challenger Center. And yeah. there's a couple of regional ones like um, the, the U.S. Rocket Center in Huntsville and the one in Houston. Um, but, yeah, a lot of other organizations that are like education and focus, like Teachers in Space. Yes, things like that. But National also Planetary Society and National Space Society and Space Frontier Foundation and the Mars Society. Us four are the sort of space advocacy nonprofits. Right. You guys have all been around for 30 plus years, 25 plus years. Uh, you've certainly uh, proven your, your chops, proven your worth, had the, the test of time. Um, Challenger Center came out of the, the Challenger crash. Uh, so that would have been 1987, 88, 87, I think. No. Nope. Yeah. 85, 86. 80, that was 80, 86, yeah, I believe. Um, so, also, SEDS, SED and SEDS, Space yeah. Generation Advisory yeah. Council are also part of, well, of the future. I think those are fantastic organizations that are great, like talent, young talent pool developers for space, uh, not just space companies, but nonprofits like us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we get a lot of people from SGAC uh, come to our station, for example. Yeah, and I've talked every time we have a conference, we try to reach out to the local SEDS chapter and try to get them involved. And we did that with Arizona State Arizona, yep. this year. Uh, so yeah, those are great organizations too. Isn't uh, isn't Bezos? Wasn't he the chapter president for his SEDS group? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be gonna post a link to that. It's SEDS.org, right? It's got to be. So. It's Students for Exploration and Development of Space. I'll make sure I got that. Uh, yes, I just I just post it and like, well, maybe I just send them to a random place. Yep, yeah, no, that's the right one. Um, yeah, so so this this club for the future has really done, you know, pretty remarkable things in just a really short time. Now you can do a lot if you commit twenty million dollars, nearly twenty million dollars, to uh, to space advocacy. So really excited about that. Um, and again, you know, this program is about the money, finance, capitalization, and the intersection with space. So, uh, you know, when you have a philanthropic uh, decision center like, like the Club for the Future, uh, it can have an awful lot of leverage out into the world. So, you know, good for them. 
good for the Mars Society, good for all the students that that are impacted um, through all these programs. I've been uh, I've been a fan of of Blue. Uh, I think people who know me know that while I admire SpaceX, um, Blue is actually my favorite rocket company. So uh, just to see that kind of grow, it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive. So. Um, do they did they have any plans for next year? You said maybe they're going to have quarterly meetings instead of biannual meetings. But uh, did they say what they wanted out of the future? Well, they they would like us to uh, us as part of the club for the future, the organizations that are participating that receive the grants. They'd like for us to see ways where we can work together. Okay. Um, they also offered, you know, Blue has six thousand employees. And they repeatedly said, get our employees engaged with your nonprofits, you know, reach out to them, uh, which we're doing. You know, there's a couple of folks that were even on the call that we are um, trying to reach out to and, and, and get involved with our programs and our plans for the next couple of years. Cool. So, well, yeah, we're it's really exciting. It's a great group to be part of, I think, for us. Well, of all the organizations you just listed, you're the only one that's 40 miles away from headquarters. So that maybe gives you a uh, competitive advantage about getting getting blue folks involved with your uh, your organization. So good, that's cool. Congrats. So that that funding it came in hmm, maybe it was 15 months ago or so because it was it was enough time for you to to join, you officially came, came on board the Marseille at the beginning of this year in January, right? Yeah, it was August of last year. Yeah. I started in December. I started just about a year ago. Okay. All right. So uh, congrats on your anniversary. Um, I'm guessing you had to report back to the club for the future, like what your successes were, but could you tell us, you know, one, two, three, four, five, these are the things that, you know, this is how we spent the money and this is what we've accomplished. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, what we talked about on the call were two programs, the high school program I mentioned earlier, and there's a VR project that we have that we've I've been working on for five years. And there's an aspect of that. We're going to do a field demo, a field science demo using VR. And we talked about that. Those were just the two things we talked about on the call because we only had three minutes and they right. asked us they had each organization. We prepared a single slide and we were only able to highlight a couple things. Um, there's a lot we do at the Mars Society. I was not able on either of the two calls with Club for the Future this year to talk about everything we do. Right. Um, and the other thing to mention is we haven't spent all the money. Like we we saved right. the majority of the money. We kind of see it as an endowment, um, to, as a cushion, so to speak, so that we can continue with our, our organization for several years if something happened where we weren't getting donations or right. or, or incoming. You know, money coming in so um but yeah so i mean most it's, that money is unspent currently most of that money is unspent. i, I would say the, the majority of it is unspent now there's two things that we have done number one is we they hired me so yeah. they've committed to, to bring me on um the second thing is we committed to help our australian organization uh and and uh you know the mars society of australia to build their long plan station um, in Arkarula, which is in Southern Australia. And so we've pledged, um, haven't spent it yet, but we've pledged $200,000 for that project, assuming other funding comes in that is able to match that. Okay. So um, that's the one, those are the two big actions we've taken. Right. Um, so in general, I can kind of just get into our finances a little bit because I know you, that was one of the topics you wanted to I, talk about. I do. Hold that thought for a second. Um, I just posted Mars VR, but I don't have a link to the uh, high school program. And I know that there's some teachers it's out on our, there. It's on our main website under education. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Um, I'll try and get that posted here in a moment. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the finances. Let's talk about, let's get into the numbers here, sir. Yeah, so um, so the Mars Society, we're normally an organization that has about a two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar a year operating budget. So that's kind of how much we spend per year. And um, COVID was a bit of a blip for us, you know, just like a lot of other organizations. <laughs> um, so I actually compare like a like what we do right now with a normal year 
quote unquote, which I look at 2019. And in 2019, we had about um, 300,000 in spending and roughly the same amount came in uh, through donations, crew fees, grants, you know, all the normal routes that we get funding. I, I should mention early on here that the Mars Society is a 100% private or publicly funded organization in terms of our, we're funded through donations from the general public. We don't get money from the government. We don't, you know, in general, we don't get a lot of money from companies. Um, as for, you know, that's, we do get some, and we, and this year we've gotten some corporate sponsorships with our conference, but in general, we're funded by just like John Q public sending us in a donation or buying a membership with the Mars society or attending our conference. Um, so that's the majority of how we get our funding. And um, when I look at the last, you know, eight years of the Mars Society, the biggest year we ever, we ever had in terms of money coming in was 2016. Um, and that's where we, we hit almost 500K in incoming donations and other revenue. But uh, and in general, we're about two to 300K at the moment, including and, this year. And you're a, you're a spend what you get organization, right? So you add up the money membership donations sponsorship conference those are the those are the bulk revenue elements mm -hmm. and you add it all up and you're like well here's how much we have this is what we're going to spend you're mostly a spend what you have we're, we're mostly we try to keep things flat that's yeah. right you know okay. um we the money going we do think on a shoestring budget in general so yeah. you know our our station in utah we have we have run that for 20 years and we've we keep it up and running. We fix things that are broken. We we put a fresh coat of paint on it and new floors in it every right. couple of years. And we just did that this year. Um, but in general, we're not like hiring a professional company to do that. We have volunteers come out and do the most do most of that work. So it's free labor. And then we we pay for the materials. You know, we maybe pay for some other things like a new HVAC system or something like that. But we always try to get things. Um, donated to us right right or, or in kind contributions um or, or there or were just, days when, you know there, so, sorry so like for, for sorry go ahead no no I, I i was gonna say there were days in the early days where it was all i'm gonna say sweat equity it was all donated time and money uh uh that's uh, right you know, the Both of our two stations, the when they were built and uh, early operations of them were 100% volunteer. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. 20, 25 year old organization that's just been plugging away and, and keeping the fire burning. So good. That's great. Um, so 200, 300,000 a year. Typically we had one year that was a half a million. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all know that everybody took a hit in 2020. Um, that's why we're doing this show in the first place, because that was our, yeah. our pivot. And um, 21 wasn't that much better. You know, our our, yeah. our donations went down a lot in 21. Yeah. Um, but they've rebounded. So Okay. Oh, they have. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So this year has been more like a normal year so far. Okay. Good. Um, so I know that you want to do some work in the Arctic Station. Um you want to do some yeah. work in the uh, uh, in the Australian outback? Um, yes. You know, I was very in Mongolia surprised. too. Mongo I, I was I just about to one. say, just about to mention Mongolia. That's, that's really there, there's a lot going on with that. We had a couple of meetings just today and uh, last week about that. So, so, so talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, those are you've got you've got kind of. Um, I'll say your crown jewels of Mars Desert Research Station because that's yeah. been operating for so long and it's so important. 270 uh, crews, over 1,500 crew members, 20 right. field seasons, huge body of research. Yeah, right. that's the big one. Yeah, that, we're, that's the number one in the world. That, that's definitely your crown jewels, and and you should be especially proud of that. But now you've got three other sites. Flashline's been around, but you know it's seen better days. It's been effectively unused for for many years. It's going to need some pretty pretty serious TLC to bring it back online. Um, 
So we're so planning right now. Yeah. We're, yeah. So basically, we haven't been up there for five years. Flashline is up in the, the Arctic Circle in Canada on Devon Island. Uh, it's uh, and we've that was our first station. We decided to build that in '99 and built it in 2000. First crew was in 2000. Um, but that's a lot harder to get to, and so we usually only mount like one expedition there every couple years, and it's usually just one crew. Um, so obviously, MDRS is a much better, you know, station for what we're trying to do overall. But certainly, Flashline is, is interesting in a lot of ways. And right now, we are planning an expedition. We just announced that it's going to go next summer, and we're looking for we're actively looking for crew members. Um, it's about a hundred thousand dollar expedition. So each crew member would need to bring about 20,000 for the mission um, as part of being part of the crew. And yeah, we do need to retrofit the station a bit, uh, make sure it's ready for habitability and safe. And, uh, and But we're very excited about that mission and we're actively planning it right now. Uh, Terry Javina just uh, posted to chat, let's figure that out, F Mars, exclamation point. So uh, thanks, Terry, appreciate it, glad you're watching. Um, and we so, do have some opportunities for funding as well um, for companies um, that are interested. We are going to sell the naming rights to Flashline because the, na the name Flashline is actually a dot com that we sold the naming rights to 20 years ago. Right. Um, that contract has run out and then some. So we are going to sell the naming rights and the price right now is $2 million for a 10 year deal. Wow. Um, and we're actively talking to companies about that. Uh, we also are looking for corporate sponsorships. You can have a company put their logo on the HAB or some other packages that we have uh, available. So we're actively looking for, you know, raising money in that way as well for both Flashline and the MDRS. So it's a hundred thousand for Flashline mission. Is that is that per year? Do you think? Yeah, it's a just for one mission to rent yeah. the Twin Otters and to get the crew up there and the supplies they need. It's the about 100, 100 to 120 is what we estimate right now. Okay. A Twin okay. Otter is a small cargo type airplane that okay. we can fly from Resolute, which is the, the closest place you can get to that is on normal air routes. So, so anybody that wants to do that, they, they yeah. got to bring up, they got to fundraise for some cash. Um, what we've had a whole set of episodes. I think we had like five hours of programming six months ago on what it takes to be an analog astronaut. So I want to recommend anybody to, that's interested in being an analog astronaut, definitely check out um, the show that the, the Mars Society was participating in for our Better Futures channel. Um, uh, what's it take to get, um, you said 200,000 for Australia to come online. Uh, what's it take? That's our pledge. Our, our pledge is essentially matching funds for the rest of what they need to bring that okay. station online. That's okay. a major project. That, that's yeah. going to be a station that has a different design than F, uh, F Mars and MDRS. It's a kind of a space station module on its side, okay. um, like a landed kind of spacecraft that landed on its side right. instead of a two-story habitat. So, um, and, and then the fact that where it is, it's, it's pretty remote as well in Arcarula. Um, so that, that's, that's a larger project, I think, than um, any of the ones we've done before. Well, then let's talk about Mongolia, because that is, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to tell the audience. So um, I was at the uh, Mars... Mars Society Conference in Arizona, um, as James has said, maybe seven weeks ago. Um, I don't know. There's probably 400, 350 people in the uh, banquet hall. It's kind of the closing night. Um, I'd been hearing about the Mongolians for a couple of days now, but I was running around like a crazy person trying to keep all the other videos going. Um, so I hadn't really been paying attention. So there I am kind of in the front row one of the one of the front row um uh, uh banquet tables and they start talking about mongolia and i admit i was pretty skeptical i was pretty skeptical 
and it blew my mind. So I was so impressed. I was one of the first people on my feet with a standing ovation. I thought they they earned it. They're doing amazing work. I hope that they can fulfill their mission. So let's talk about, you know, let's talk about what the Mongolians are doing, because I bet you most people on this call don't know what that is. And then let's talk about the money, because this is a money program. Yeah, so the Mongolian organization that was presenting at our conference, they're called Mars V. I just put the URL in the chat for you, Michael. Thank you. They are um, an organization in Mongolia that has support at the highest level from their government. And they are essentially a Mars Society type organization. They're, they're now our official chapter in Mongolia. And they're, they have several thousand members. And they're working on an analog research program there in Mongolia. <laughs> they have the advantage of the Gobi Desert um, is a great Mars analog. Um, and, and there's a lot of areas in the Gobi that we could practice exploring Mars. Um, and they're very excited and very interested as a society in, in Mars. Um, Mongolia is landlocked between Russia and China and they have a cultural history of, of, you know, the nomadic society, you know, the warrior culture from, from ancient times. Um, and and that, a lot of that carries through to the way they are, the way the modern Mongolians are. Um, they're very independent people. They're very competent and they're very dedicated and hardworking people. And I've been extremely impressed, just like you, Michael, I've been extremely impressed every every interaction I've had with them. Um, Robert was invited by them to come out and visit earlier this year and scout out um, locations for an analog station in the Gobi Desert. And so he did, and he was treated, he came out to Mongolia and he was treated like a celebrity. And there's a great video that we watched at the conference about his trip to Mongolia where um, he met with the you know, senior federal agencies over there the education ministry and the economic ministry and the prime minister. And they also took him out to a, an opera that they were performing that was about Mars. There's actually a famous poet in Mongolia that about a hundred years ago was, he was 25 years old and he wrote a poem about Mars. It's called dreams of Mars. And it's a very culturally significant poem for them. And so one of the things that they're going to do this coming year, in addition to, having the first mission at their new analog station is to create a monument to the poem called Dreams of Mars. And uh, it's really cool. And we're going to be part of that, that monument's dedication. But uh, they're essentially planning a nomadic Mars analog station that you could pack up and move to a different location in the Gobi. It's the same size as a normal, as one of our other stations. It's going to be a, it's not a two-story building. It's two yurts or they call them gars next to each other mm -hmm. um but they're very futuristic looking they're they're working on the designs right now and they've got solar panels as well as having um you know the ability to just go inside and use them for the crew quarters and for laboratory space um they've talked about also having a greenhouse component to it as well um but the idea is you pack all that up and move it to a different location and be able to explore a large area of the Gobi that way. Um, and so we're working with them to plan the first mission, which will be next May. And we're um, planning to help with the crew selection as well as the science program that's happening for that. What, uh, what, what does it cost to do something like that? So we've got some orders of magnitude, 100,000 per mission at uh, up in the Arctic, mm -hmm. 200,000, but that's only a portion of, uh, yeah. of a pension grant to build an entirely new site down in Australia. Uh, what's it, what, what are the obligations for, uh, and expectations for Mongolia? Yeah. I mean, they they are self funding it. And so I don't, and I don't, it's not the same as building like the MDRS campus. If we had to yeah. build the MDRS campus from zero, I think it'd probably be around 400k or so um, to build that, and, and so it's not that much. You know, I'd say it's probably one 100 to 200k, but they're getting a lot of that in kind from right. people that are just interested in this, and they have suppliers and 
you know, there's, like I said, there's a lot of people in that country that just are part of this effort, even before they talk to us. Uh, let, and, let, and they have a lot of support. So let's talk numbers for a second. So they were talking about about 3,000 members in their organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have, call it eight to 12,000 people kind of in your spheres, in your networks. I don't think that that's what your membership numbers are. No, that's, it's, we have, we have uh, 90,000 followers on social media. We have about 30,000 in our email bulletin, which is high traffic. And we have, in terms of paid members, under 2,000. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you, there, there's a lar much larger community that's part of the Mars Society yeah. than just our paid members. <laughs> I, 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 you know, here's an aside. Um, I've been involved around the edge of the Mars Society for 20 years. It was the very first conference I ever went to. Uh, but I only became an actual member a few weeks ago, right? So there's people like me that are, supportive and interested and and you know i would say mars adjacent uh so you know i know that we've talked about that being a priority to kind of you know raise your membership numbers but here you've got mongolia with you know a really unexpected number of three thousand people in their environment um yeah, 90,000 in the Mars Society social media network. That actually makes a lot of sense. I know your YouTube channel is 25,000. I know that one by heart. But um, yeah, it is kind of amazing to have your level of influence, Zubrin's level of influence, and and seeing the ripple effects of 25 years of just constantly pushing the same thing. It's, it's, really, quite, it's really quite cool. So um, without... without you know, you know, your leadership, past executives, uh, leadership, uh, uh, Zubrin throwing a big rock in the pond and having all those ripples come out. The, the Mongolians and the Australians wouldn't have probably any program at all, but now there's this global unified effort. So that's, that's got to yeah. be that, right. That's got to be that. And we, we also have partners in Europe, you know, space Renaissance, yeah. Yep. initiative as well as our Poland chapter. There's two analogs in Poland. There's one in Iceland. There's the Amadi program that's going to be in the uh, Negev desert, I believe, next, which we've had members part of. Our French chapter is huge. Um, right. Over 300 people in our French chapter. There's you know many people from ISA as well in the French chapter. And then over in Asia, like we have a Chinese chapter and an Indian chapter that are very large. Lots of support there. Um, and then across Asia as well. I mean, there's a lot like Singapore and the Philippines. And one of our students was from the Philippines right. for the high school program. And so, right. and we're hoping for big things from him in the future. Awesome. But uh, yeah, there's, we have pretty broad support internationally. It's great to be part of the Mars Society because yeah. we're kind of a globally minded organization, very diverse. Yeah, yeah. Um, Doug Plata is going to be our guest on uh, on Wednesday this week, and he's got a comment from the chat here. Um, Flashline shows that distance makes a big difference. Arcarulli is five hours from the closest uh, home hardware store. Uh, why not have an analog base near a Home Depot with local volunteer population and a large university? Now, I know that... Um, uh, uh, Doug, if you don't know Terry Trevino, you all should exchange contact information. Terry was at the um, uh, the analog site in North Dakota just a few months ago, and that is that is actually pretty close, and that's on a university campus. So there there are right. there's at least that one, but uh, I'm going to put words in James and and Zubrin's mouth here. What they are trying to do as an analog site is re replicate the remoteness, uh, the geography. Um, <laughs> Zubrin told us a good story about uh, finding dinosaur bones out there. Um, 
In a so, place where uh, rovers never could. Yes. Right. In a place where rovers never could. Uh, very important detail from from Zurin. Um, so I mean, I'm going to let yeah, James well, answer that. Answer but but my answer is talk to Terry Trevino. There's things you can do on a local campus that are great, and there's things that you can't do unless you're out in the wilderness somewhere. Yeah, the, the short answer, Doug, is that's not what we would have on Mars, right? Um, the other point, I mean, not, analog, not all analog programs around the world by us and others are, are have the same goals. Um, what we try to do at the Mars Society, and you can take a look at this book that Robert wrote called Mars on Earth, um, which is a little known book. It's about how the flash line station was built, but also why, why we do this. Um, we're trying to show the human factors challenges of working on Mars and how you would explore a large area with a, with a human crew. I mean, Robert is a little anti the like Mars 500 experiment, for example, like having a crew isolate and not do anything, you know, that's not really what we believe you're going to, is going to happen with humans on Mars. We believe that the first crew that goes to Mars is going to explore a large area for science reasons. And so that's kind of what we practice. That's we try to set up our analog bases so that we can practice exploring as well as being in an isolated environment and the challenges that go with that. The challenges of human beings working together in an isolated environment. One of the things I've noticed is we have a lot of crews that like know each other that work together. Maybe they all are from the same university and they're they apply together and they're friends and colleagues. And then they get out to Utah and you know the gloves come off you know people get a little dehydrated and they're time crunched and maybe things aren't going according to plan and that's the real test of working together on mars when you have when you're on mars you're gonna have people's lives in your hands you know how do you respond to that and and so you know one of the reasons why we have our stations in isolated environments is because that's a good we can simulate that a little bit. You know, we can go out to the Utah desert where, you know, there's not a ton of cell phone signal and you, we have to truck our water in, you know, and you have to kind of plan ahead of what you need while you're there because there's no Walmart five minutes away. You know, the closest Walmart is two hours away. So, um, you know, it's, it's not life threatening to be there, but, you know, if you have a broken arm, if you twist your ankle, there, you know, you're going you're gonna to need some help out there. There have Utah. been medical emergencies. There's been some at high, uh, uh, high seas. There's been some at uh, MDRS. And there's been some at um, bi uh, Biosphere, right? Those are just right. the ones I know of, right? So yeah. that being able to kind of react in a remote environment and having the skills to do something is pretty important. I, I do think there's value, you know, I'm, I'm out here in, in the Seattle region. So is James, I would love for uh, university of Washington to build an analog site. Um, I don't think, think that's on anybody's to do list right now. Um, uh, but but I think there are, I think there's value in having, you know, a, a big university side by side to, to a program, but I know that that's not what you're aiming for. And 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 you've had other the the Mars Society has had other opportunities to do exactly that. That 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 that's not the data that they're trying to capture. It's just not a, the approach we're taking. Ours is more um, on a shoestring than having a university run it. Now, I, I definitely want to give a shout out to Biosphere Two and Kai Stats and the Sam. That's a really innovative new analog that he's setting up in the, the prototype biosphere environment that they built initially, um, the small version that then they later scaled up to be the large facility we all know. Of. Now they, he's, he's essentially repurposing that small building to be a Mars analog, a moon and Mars analog. And, um, and he, it is part of the University of Arizona and it is going to have broad support, you know, um, from the university community there. And I think that's great. And it's just different than what we do at the MDRS. And it's only 40 miles from town. But it is, it's way out there. I mean, there's a town that's, I think, uh, 
8,000. Yeah, 8, Oracle is pretty close. We didn't go, to, you and I, yeah. when we were there in October, we didn't go to Oracle, but I think yep. that's a nice, decent that's sized a, town. There's a small by. town of like 8,000 people that's nearby, but the, the closest big town that would have a Phoenix. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're still a ways out there. So, all right. So let's kind of get back to um, the money, the finances. Uh, we've got about, we've got about 15 minutes le left. If you want to, if you want to wrap this up. Um, but what is, what does 2023 look like? What is the budgeting process? Assuming you said that, that this year was kind of a little bit more closer to normal two to 300,000. Um, uh, you're going to get some more donations, maybe increase the size of the membership. So that's some new potential revenue. Um, you've got sponsorship. Uh, you've got the, the, uh, the income from the endowment where most of the club for the future capital is, is held. So what, what is the budget when you decide, okay, you know, let's figure out what we're going to spend it on. What does that look like? Like how do how do how does that budgetary process happen? And then so let's talk about like the big the big line items. Yeah, I mean we're we're certainly still in the process of setting up a lot of those processes. Um, you know, it's my first year as executive director. There's a lot of things we weren't really doing as an, as an organization before I came on, and so. Um, in general, what I'm trying to do is get us to program level budgets. Like every, any nonprofit will have an annual report and it'll have in a general sense what their operating revenue is and their operating expenses are. And they usually divide those into programs um, so they can, you know, say, okay, we're, we have this education area. We're going to go after this many students a year and we spend this much on it. So you can kind of scale and say, oh, well, if caught, we spend $100 per student. And we're reaching 500 students. If you give us more money, we could reach more students. You know, right. so that's I, I'd like I'd love to have like that as an offering for the blue origins of the world, of like give us fifty thousand dollars and we can read reach this many more students per year with our high school program, for example. Um, so so having the, that understanding is what we're trying to get to. Um, if I look at what our big initiatives are coming up. We are trying to raise money for the uh, education programs. Uh, that's primarily gonna be done through corporate sponsors. We are also gonna do a crowdfunding campaign for this research, the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. That's analogous to the one I ran for Mars VR a couple okay. years ago. And so I've, I've run two crowdfunding campaigns for the Mars Society, both for Mars VR. The first one was in 2018, we raised $31,000, and the last one was in 2021, and we raised 109000 And so using that same methodology, I'm going to try to raise money for the MDRS by having the general public purchase small pledges, reward levels, you know, things like a model of the MDRS. Uh, we have a Friends of MDRS package we're going to talk about where you can get your name on a plaque uh, there and some other things and selling t-shirts and, and stickers and things like that. Um, and then we will have some larger packages um, for major donors as well as part of that campaign. So, so we're gonna come out with that and hopefully raise uh, one to 200,000 with that. We're also, and that'll be in the first quarter of next year. We're also um, planning to do that Arctic mission in the summer and so we're going to raise money to do that. We're hopefully going to raise, an, you know, enough money to do that mission so that there's no net expenses to the Mars Society. You know, okay. we raise the funds to run the mission. Right. So in general, what I'm trying to get us to is if we know we want to do something, that we have a budget for it, and then we go fundraise against that budget before we actually do the thing. Right. At right. the end of the year, we're not we're positive or, or we're zero, we're flat. We're not uh, you know in the red putting on our programs. And so um, so the biggest programs we have right now are the MDRS and the Arctic Mission, and then it's what we're doing with education. We also have other programs like we have the Mars Society Ambassador program, which is a cadre of people that can represent us and talk to us in their communities and public speak about humans to Mars. 
we run that program on a very you know shoestring budget basically just volunteer coordination and a little bit of funds to give them stickers and outreach materials right but um that's not going to be a huge hit to our, our 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 working capital next year right okay so assuming you're able to raise for these kind of new initiatives um if i'm keeping my math kind of clear uh that might be a a three uh, sorry a uh five to six hundred thousand dollar budget maybe even seven if you've got the uh you're normally at two to three hundred so starting there and then you're going to bring in a hundred for flash flash line and then another one to two hundred on um uh, on the crowd crowd funding so that gets you pretty close to five or six hundred thousand there and then there's other stuff is that is that right am i doing my you know there's a little overlap there i'd say when we have a normal a normal quote unquote normal year like i was talking about earlier where it's 200 to 300 thousand of spending as well as um donation grants crew fees you know that that's a mix of things the largest piece of that pie are the individual donations okay um and so are they from the crowdfunding campaign they... is designed to get a little bit more than average of those this, okay. this coming year and to direct those into mdrs okay um uh we we will still have our our normal set of crew um rotations at the station for you know the field next field season and we'll have a little bit we had a little bit of improvement budget this year for mdrs we'll have a little bit next year as well um but that'll be sort of a normal a normal year overall for mdrs okay of two to three thousand of like 200k i'd say um okay. then flash lines on top of that and again right. that's going to be right. new, you know, money. new money that comes in that we spend to do flash line we're not going to dip into our endowment to do flash right. line yep. that's we've okay. decided we'd already decided not to do that yep. you know, last year so um so it's got to be new money that comes in to do flash line and then new money that comes in to scale up our education program as well. The high school program we did last this past year, we ran on our own. There was really no costs. Right. And we really didn't ask for anything other than a $50 registration fee for the students. And we never fund did any fundraising for it. It was just basically a pilot program right. that we did on our own. I was the coordinator. So next year when we scale it up, we'll be bringing on some volunteers, maybe some paid staff to help run that program and scale it up commensurate with the funding we're able to get we're also actually for that program talking about not just doing it online in the summer but doing it at a brick and mortar institution in the spring awesome. and possibly more than one so um, so that's also where some funding would go is helping know, facilitate and make sure those programs ran successfully i know that there's some uh high school robotics teachers that have been paying attention to our show for a little while. And I'm sure I'm going to get some phone calls about that pretty soon. Um, yeah. So we're talking, and we're talking about high school robotics, uh, yeah. like Mars Rover kits and things like that. And then how, you know, if we do get some money for STEM education as, as new grants for us, that we may put that, some of that into doing high school Rover kits and, field trip in a box type kits that we could then distribute at cost or maybe for free, maybe sponsored to different uh, institutions, educational institutions. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go and ask you to pull out your crystal ball. Uh, Doug has asked a question that I'm pretty sure you can't actually answer correctly, but let's, let's play some games here. Sure. Um, how do you think, Mars will be paid for. I'm what I'm really assuming is how I'm going to kind of put some clarity on your question, Doug. Hopefully, I'm right. Um, how do we get to Mars? How do we get people to Mars? And where's the budget for that going to come from? Uh, I'm going to make some assumptions that SpaceX is pretty deeply involved with that, but not the whole story. Um, but where where do you think? You know, let's put some time frames and some budgets on there. What's it take to put a crewed mission onto onto the Martian surface? Yeah, I mean, SpaceX certainly is in the lead right now on doing this. And that's what their whole Starship initiative is organized to be, is a human Mars program that's private. 
Now they get the majority of their funds uh, historically from the Falcon 9 development was from the U.S. government. Yep. Now they are selling um, rides on the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, and um, and they will be selling rides on Starship, and they are selling rides on Starship, like Dear Moon. They pre-sold, even though Starship's not operational yet. Um, so, so, so some of that is coming from private sources, but the vast majority of SpaceX is funded by the U.S. taxpayer. And that's been the case. And so when I you know, on the surface to answer Doug's question, we're going to get to Mars on the backs of government funding, I think, primarily. But there's an important role for the private sector to play because the private sector right now is the one that's developing the technology that's far ahead of the SLS, that, the, that is the government program to go to, back to the moon um, and possibly go to Mars you know, with, a, with an advanced upper stage. You could do, you know, you could do a Mars mission, a human Mars mission with SLS if you have a upper stage that could lift and throw to Mars, um, and that's uh, like what Robert talked about in his book. You know, in the '90s, was essentially an SLS type rocket. He called it the Ares, but it was a shuttle derived design that he worked on at Martin Marietta in the '80s. You know, and so it's funny when we see SLS. You know, when he talks about seeing SLS fly. He's like, yeah, I, I designed that in the 80s. Like it's not, there's nothing like new or innovative about that rocket. Well, um, the NASA administrator on Sunday after the Artemis splashdown, I uh, kind of point blank said, you know, the Obama administration tasked us to get there by 2033. We're not going to hit that. We're looking at the end of the 30s, the end, the end of the 30s. That's the less you're saying. Yeah, right. So well, through, yeah, I mean, we can go really deep on what NASA's plans are for Artemis. I don't think they're really just to just to finish answering Doug, though, like it's going to be the private sector driving the mission. You know, we, we're not we, you know, if, if it is SpaceX, if Starship is the way that we get to Mars, then it will have been a, a private mission, a private product that's been designed specifically for Mars without a government mandate yep. and, and, but the funding ultimately will come from the government because that's, you know, that's who's, you know, that's the majority of where SpaceX gets their funding now. Yeah. It's pretty interesting watching, uh, watching the money move around at SpaceX. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, he, Musk isn't putting his own personal cash into it and hasn't been for a long time. Uh, they've got another capital raise happening now that's in the <clears throat> billion five range on a 110 billion valuation. Um, and that's, that's yeah. private capital, right? So they're and getting Starlink also the, the whole reason they designed <laughs> right. the Starlink system was to fund Mar a Mars mission. And they just to have added revenue coming in to fund a Mars mission. They just added in the Star Shield mm -hmm. version, which is the military capable, military grade version of uh, Star Starlink. <laughs> um, they're they've got half a million subscribers. Uh, the the commercial side, the 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 civilian side has half a million subscribers. That's a pretty good cash cow, right? That's a pretty good cash cow. So, so, uh, Doug, to kind of answer your question. There's going to be federal funds coming in for R&D, primarily for the moon. There's going to be private capital coming in to fund other R&D. And then there's revenues from launch, whether that's Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, or, or uh, Starship. And then there's revenues from Starlink. So that's... There's a lot, of, and that's just one company. Let's really be clear, right? Because the United Arab Emirates has a, have an entirely different government-funded program. And uh, just two, three weeks ago, Korea announced that they're going to to Mars. So there are there are there are nationalistic plans that are far more. I would say more ambitious, maybe, maybe, or maybe not more capable. I'm a little skeptical, but certainly more ambitious than the NASA plan currently. So, and, and look, the U S the U S is not asleep anymore at, at going to, to Mars. I mean, I, 
I was I was just watching CNN last night where they were talking about the Orion capsule splashed down and Mars came up as we're eventually going to Mars. Like it, the anchor, right. the CNN anchor was just like, oh, yeah, of course, we're eventually going to Mars with this. Right. And I'm and for me, it's like, that's great. They didn't need <laughs> to talk that way. Right. Even a couple years ago, even right. a couple years ago, it was like, no, we're going to the moon, not Mars. Right. right. So I, I think, you know, I definitely think that the U.S. is on a path to go to Mars, whether or not SpaceX is the way we get there. It just still take longer, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. All right, sir. With that, it is straight up at six o'clock. I'm going to close out this uh, program. Uh, Terry and Doug, thanks for your feedback. We always appreciate y'all in the chat. Um, I appreciate my team doing a great job keeping things flowing here. Um, uh, and with that, we're going to close out. Thanks a lot, James, for being patient and coming back a second time. We really appreciate it. It's very, it's very enlightening. Always a pleasure, Michael. Roger. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.